Hi everybody, good morning and um, thank you for joining us today for our fifth or sixth uh, ADAPT webinar series, uh, Creating Tomorrow's World. And today we're focusing on personalized human computer interaction. So this is a big focus for ADAPT within our digitally enhanced experience research strand. And we've got some notable uh, researchers within there in the area of uh, HCI, not least uh, Professor Ben Cowan, who will be uh, uh, speaking with us today, um, but also Gavin Doherty, who is a UX researcher um, and a co-founder of Silver Cloud Health, which was um, notably acquired by Hamwell during the summer. Um, Silver Cloud, of course, is a, a, a digital behavioral healthcare company. Um, and also Rachel McDonald, who's um, a researcher in virtual humans and interacting with avatars. So HCIs are really important for us in ADAPT. Um, we've also got a busy industry research and uh, research collaborative program. So if you're interested in that, please do get in touch. It's collaboration at adaptcenter.ie. Uh, so human computer, computer interaction, it's both a multidisciplinary field and a multimodal um, focus as well. So from a multidisciplinary perspective, we, we, we bring together computer scientists and psychologists and human factors researchers, engineers and designers. And um, it's also critically important for all digital interactions in this increasingly digital world and um, where we're seeking to blend physical and digital and where our expectations for the technology are always increasing. As I said, it's also multimodal. So we're, we're covering speech and text and graphics and animation and haptics and immersion and um, blended reality. So today we are fortunate to have three really great speakers who will share their perspectives on personalized human com uh, computer interaction. Um, first up, we're going to have uh, Dr. Amelia Kelly, who is the VP of Speech Technology with Soapbox Labs. And Soapbox is, if you don't know them already, they're an amazing Irish startup that's developed a business to business platform for children's speech recognition. Um, uh, after Amelia, then we have Alan Coleman. So Alan uh, was co-founder and CEO of Brightbill, and now he's co-founder and CEO of Sweeper. And they're focused on personalized uh, digital uh, customer engagement. And then finally, we have ADAPT's principal investigator and UCD professor, um, uh, Ben Callan, whose research in HCI is a key part of our uh, ADAPT research focus. Um, we'll have an opportunity for questions at the end of the session, so put them in the chat um, uh, or the, 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 the Q&A um, widget in Zoom. Uh, and without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Amelia. Thanks, Declan, and um, thanks to ADAPT for hosting this webinar. Um, I'd like to share my screen and just present a few slides. Um, so um, first of all, um, wait, let me share my screen first before I get going. Um, um, hopefully you can all see that. So just uh, a quick introduction. Um, my name is Dr. Amelia Kelly. Um, I've worked in um, speech technology, and uh, that includes speech recognition, chatbots, human computer interaction for about 15 years now. I have a master's and a PhD from Trinity College in linguistics and speech technology, and I'm also a Fulbright scholar for the years 2020 and 2021. Um, at the moment, I uh, am the vice president of speech technology at Soapbox Labs, where I've worked for the last seven years. Um, at Soapbox, we make um, speech recognition and speech technology products uh, specifically for children's speech. So we build tools that um, deliver engaging, fun, frictionless interactions and digital experiences for kids. So um, before I get into the details, I'd just like to show you a quick video that just showcases exactly what this means. Now, hopefully you can hear this and see it all properly. Hey, computer. I want to watch my favorite show. Welcome back, Noah. Let's continue our adventure. I want to do a different one this time. Something different? Good idea. Where shall we start? In the spooky cave or deep in the forest? In the deep, dark forest. Into the forest we go. Noah, I don't think we're the only ones here. We better get ready. Which will we use? The enchanted sword we found or the magic orb? Do a spell. No, wait. Pick up the sword. Okay, Noah. Sword it is. Count me in from three. Three, two, one. So 
So I think that really sums up exactly what we're trying to achieve here when we talk about these uh, fun and frictionless digital experiences for kids. This is the um, pinnacle of human computer interaction for kids. And it's not just with televisions, it's with toys, it's with tablets, um, it's with uh, mobile phones. Um, so the basis of this and what I work on, what my background is in, is in the actual speech technology that underpins it. Um, what we've seen in the last um, decade or so as apps and games and interactive experiences, voice experiences um, grow in, in usage by adults and children alike, is that adult voice technology doesn't actually work properly for kids' speech. After researching this for a good long time, we've come up with um, four key areas where um, adult voice tech really, or why adult voice tech really fails for kids' speech. So first of all, um, it, there are physical differences, obviously, between kids and adults. Um, children are smaller, and that means that they have smaller vocal tracts, they have smaller vocal folds, and that means that the pitch of their voice is higher, that the energy um, is contained in different frequency bands, the um, energy and the information that would actually um, convey meaning using your voice. Also, kids' speech patterns are different. So children don't seem to follow the same social rules as adults when they um, conduct conversation. So they pause, they whisper, they shout, they have uh, strange sentence constructions, they get distracted in ways that are unpredictable. And when you're making a speech recognition system, it's not only important that you have the actual audio data of the kids' voices, but you also need to model these speech patterns so you can accurately transcribe what the kids are saying. Um, I can give you just a quick example um, so you can hear how uh, voices change from childhood to adulthood. Umbrella. 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 Um, in those, um, you, you can hear the, the differences in the voices, but the, the graphs you were seeing there um, are just our, our spectrogram. So it, it shows in, in kind of red and yellow where the energy, uh, the meaningful energy uh, resides within the spectrum and what frequency bands it does. So as well as those obvious differences, um, there's also behavioral differences in that um, children, when they're using technology, tend to do so in places that are quite noisy. So we're talking um, kitchens, classrooms, um, cars, playgrounds, all of these um, places are quite noisy. There is a lot of interference and we need to build out voice solutions that actually work in these places. Um, this is, is very important as well because um, children these days have, or we call them digital natives now, but they're also voice natives. Um, I don't know about you, but whenever I'm interacting with voice technology, I tend to behave myself quite well. I tend to speak and enunciate quite clearly. Children don't do that. They've grown up in a world where um, uh, there's smart speakers in every home and they, they try and shout at them and talk to them like normal people. So we need to capture all those behaviors when we're making a model for child speech. Finally, um, the privacy is, is a very, very key and crucial thing. So at Soapbox, whenever we build uh, children's speech technology. We do it uh, with the privacy concerns forefront from the ground up. Um, we've no competing business models. Everything that we do um, with the audio and text data that we have is solely to make this technology better for different use cases for kids. So what are those use cases? Um, well, we find that, um, and you know, back to the theme of human computer interaction, it's one thing to solve a hard problem like children's speech recognition, but that's not good enough. What do you do with that? You, you, there are a lot of APIs out there where you can upload your voice file and you can receive back a text file, but this isn't really very useful in the world that children inhabit. So what, more, more often than not, it's important to do something with that text file or with that audio file that then is useful for children to do things, to have experiences like learning and playing. So at Soapbox, we've focused on the education market and the gaming or play market in order to create tools based on speech technologies that are very helpful for, for kids when they're learning, when they're practicing reading, when they're learning a new language, when they're uh, speaking to their toys, uh, they're, when they're um, speaking to their television sets. So we've created a host of products, for example, wake word, personalized wake words, uh, voice search, uh, to reading practice and pronunciation assessment. 
So not only do we uh, give back a transcription of an audio file, like uh, a generic speech recognition system, but also we give back further information and a deeper analysis of the audio itself so that the companies that we sell to our clients can come up with really, really engaging and fun digital experiences for kids based on voice. We, offer, we also offer um, these solutions in various delivery mechanisms, for example, an online API, which can be high accuracy, deep learning solutions available via RESTful web service um, with really good latency. But also there are situations where um, a client might want to use the same technology offline. So we offer all our models packaged up offline in SDKs uh, with it for integration with iOS, Android, web browser. Again, it's low latency. And all the data in this situation will be processed on the device with no data transfer to the cloud required. And finally, and I, this is where it gets really interesting, and I think this is where the future lies in these voice experiences for kids, uh, we're looking into edge AI. So high accuracy, state-of-the-art deep learning on microchips. So um, there are low cost inference chips of low power consumption, and it can be deployed by, by a variety of micro, microcontrollers. Again, all the data is processed on chips and no data transfer to the cloud is required. So this is very interesting for um, the likes of toy manufacturers, for example, where there's no need for them to transfer the child's private data up to the cloud for storage or use by any company. It can remain on the toy, on the chip, on the device, and the children can have a really good, fun, engaging voice experience. So um, that's about it. Uh, just a final message from our founder, Dr. Patricia Scanlon. Um, she says, it's hard to imagine a future where voice isn't a key feature of all kids' toys, games, devices, experiences, and learning tools. I really agree with this, and you can read more about it in these various publications like Wired, Forbes, Fortune, and uh, Fast Company and TechCrunch. So um, yeah, I'd like to thank you for having me here today, just to give this small introduction to the company and the things that we're working on, and be excited to hear from uh, my fellow panelists today as well. So thank you. Thank you, Amelia. I have to say, it doesn't matter how many times I've heard you speak or Patricia or others from Soapbox, it's really so engaging and it's really, it's a great story. Fun and frictionless digital experiences. I'm definitely going to use that one again. So, um, so clearly in your world, speech is a key signal and it conveys meaning and need and intent. Um, and I guess the from a sweeper perspective, it's the framework for interpreting these signals and for orchestrating personalized experiences and interactions is a big, big challenge. And it's one that um, that uh, sweeper is tackling. So I'm going to hand over to sweeper CEO and co-founder Alan Coleman to, to maybe hear a little bit more about this. Great. Thank you, Declan. Um... Uh, and uh, uh, thank you, Amelia. That was really fascinating to learn more about uh, Soapbox Labs. Um, so I'm going to pick up the mantle um, from Amelia uh, in relation to Sweeper. Um, and we have um, uh, a slightly broader focus in uh, how we think about human computer interaction. Um, so where our Soapbox Lab focuses on the efficacy of capturing utterances and ensuring that we understand intent from children. Um, we started Sweeper with under a premise of um, uh, initially trying to solve the, the specific challenges around technical support in the home. And so what I might do very briefly is just show you a quick video that shows that intent. And then I'll, I'll talk to you a bit further about how Sweeper has evolved this vision to, uh, to kind of peel the onion to understand the very many layers of context and personalization that ultimately drive effective engagement. So once you've understood and captured what the customer or what the, um, um, the consumer uh, wants uh, via a voice channel or via an application, an app or the web, the question then is how do we understand the true intent and how do we make sure that what help or what, um, what information we provide back is is guided and contextual and relevant to their need. So let me just quickly share my screen. I think this should do it, hopefully. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I got caught in a world of um, security preferences here on Zoom for some reason. 
Okay, one second. So can you, hopefully you can see my screen? Yep. Okay. It's a brief video, but hopefully you can see. Guys, Dad, the internet's gone. I got me all problems here, son. Is that to me speaking? Sweeper, why is this game not working? Let me see how I can help. Sweeper, can you help get the speakers working too? In an increasingly connected home, we could all use a helping hand. I've sent the best instructions for your particular home setup. The game server seems to be busy. I'll check it again in a few minutes. As usual. <laughs> The game server's busy, love. It'll be okay again soon. Hand this to your father. Dad. Sweeper, why is the oven cold? I see a problem with the heating element in your oven. I'll get a technician to call you as soon as possible to discuss your options. In an increasingly connected home, we could all use a little help. We could all use Sweeper. Simple care for the connected home. So um, that, um, that was Sweeper's original vision. And um, it was where we started the business. And when we started to try to um, really, uh, sorry, one second, let's share the slide. So when we started to really understand the challenges faced by trying to provide technical support specifically in the home, we realized that it was, um, it was a multifaceted challenge. It wasn't just the initiation of capturing the customer's utterance and then establishing the intent and then there was a whole plethora of different um uh contexts that we needed to to take and analyze in real time so that we would know exactly how best to help the customer uh, with their problem at that time so we actually focused initially on um aptitude so we determined that different customers of different technical capability would require different types of assistance or different pathways of intervention. And we also focus on diagnostics because obviously in a connected world or a, 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 where, where actual measures are available, that can materially affect and inform the pathways that you choose to take. But as we began to explore, um, uh, explore and, and execute our business model, we began to appreciate actually that the principles of how digital interactions are built, um, particularly as we move now towards what's increasingly be referred to as hyper-personalization, about focusing on the individual, focusing on the one, requires a much more uh, subtle and powerful model for providing personalized experiences. So we uh, evolved our our focus so that we no longer focus exclusively on the connected home, but focus now more broadly on all customer facing interactions um, to do with service and, and support, um, including technical support, but also including other pathways like billing and onboarding and, and other moments on our key customer journeys. And we, the platform effectively allows organizations to author interactions and journeys for customers that are heavy, highly personalized and highly contextual. So we, we evolved our, our personalization model into three key buckets, psychological and behavioral, 
all about the individual. Who are we trying to help and what's their, what's their disposition? What's their capabilities? Contextual and environmental. What, where are they? What environment are they in? What do we know about that environment given the time of day, given the weather, given any other extraneous factor? What's measurable about that environment? What can we, what's, what scores, what measures can we get now to understand what's happening? And then finally, um, what do we know of our previous interactions with this customer? What do we know they've asked about previously? Is this the first or second or third time this week they've asked the same question? Is this a new question? Is this a series of, of different issues? How long have they been a customer? And, what, and also things like what are prevailing issues for customers like this that we ought to be aware of? All of these things combine to apply personalization at different moments in the journey, whether it's reducing the cognitive load um, for a customer who's using a digital channel or digital interaction by anticipating what they might need, by doing something like uh, query prompting, by, you know, and that query prompting can be informed by a prevailing issue in that jurisdiction, a prevailing issue for that customer or people of that type, um, or uh, simply something that the diagnostics have thrown up to give us an indication that it's likely that the customer may be asking this question. So rather than make them articulate it, if they aren't technical or, or struggle with articulation of, of the issue, um, get in front of it. So in, in dealing with technical support issues, we you sometimes will get um, uh, questions like, the box isn't working, or my sky won't work. And when you try to appeal to understand what does that mean, you know, does it mean that there's a challenge with Wi-Fi? Does it mean there's a challenge with broader connectivity? Does it mean there's a challenge with a streaming service? Does it mean the television isn't working? So people, you know, one of the reasons technical support relies so heavily on humans uh, today is because um, capturing the intent from someone is a difficult task. It's a, it requires, the, there's as much work done in our digital interactions um, in understanding what the customer might need and, and um, before we even think about the solution to the challenge that they might be facing. Uh, and so th those, are the, those are the three contexts. So again, building on what, um, what Amelia was talking about earlier on, um, Sweeper started with that problem space looked at voice and said voice is a very democratizing technology that will allow people who are non-technical to be able to articulate a problem as they best can. But secondly, it's also, um, it has basically, no, there's no latency in it, as in, as soon as I'm ready and willing to um, utter an expletive, let, you know, filled uh, sentence regarding my TV not working or I can't watch my favorite show, that is the moment at which the, prob the problem solving or at least problem, um, the problem taking, as in taking the problem from the customer should commence. And voice obviously is a very powerful mo uh, modality to allow us to do that. But, but in trying to look at that challenge, we then realize, well, you know, understand capturing the utterance is one thing, running all these tests to understand what words have been used combined with what context we now know allows us to drive clarification. And now we have clarification, we have resolution. What are the appropriate types of solutions for customers of this type with problems of this type and given everything we know? And, and that, that sophistication is inexorably where all digital interaction is heading. Like there's no question in my mind that whether plot organizations use platforms like Sweeper to achieve it. This is the future of how digital interaction needs to go. It needs to be this anticipatory. It needs to be this individualized and, use high, and be hyper-personalized. And it doesn't need to be driven by some uh, nebulous, artificial, intelligent, uh, machine-learned um, kind of paradigm that is yet to emerge. These are things that we can do today and do do today in interactions that we build. But it's about being cognizant of how you build these things and, and not settling for interactions that are 
generic or will just do. These are ones we try to build interactions that genuinely um, delight customers such that they have a strong preference for digital channels over voice, over human interaction. And the reason they have a delight is because it's highly effective and highly available 24 seven and, and gets it more right than wrong and powerful. And, the, and those are the pillars that make um, digital interaction successful. Uh, so I'm not sure where I am on time actually. So, um, but you're, you're, if you need a couple of more minutes, you're okay. I think I probably covered everything that's that, that I wanted to. So uh, with that, maybe I'll I'll um, hand over an, an extra two minutes to Ben, who begged me offline for them. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I always go over time, so thanks very much, Alan. Yeah, yeah he'll, need, he'll need it. <laughs> and uh, so, Alan, that was fascinating. I mean, it just shows you this kind of the you know if you if you like the invisible plumbing the infrastructure the scaffolding that's needed really to achieve these um, kind of seamless frictionless personalized anticipatory um, uh, effective and engaging interactions and experiences uh, for consumers I mean there's a um, there's a I'm not probably quoting it properly but there is this concept of you know technology becoming invisible where you don't even notice it anymore mm -hmm. they're working for us it's making our lives easier it's offloading maybe mundane tasks um, and, and, and giving us back time so that was really interesting and um, and uh, you know a huge challenge and it's great that uh, an Irish startup is, is tackling it as right at the heart of it okay so um, handing over now to Professor Ben Cowan, my colleague in ADAPT and uh, uh, Professor uh, in, um, uh, in Computing and Human-Computer Interaction in UCD. So over to you, Ben. Um, yeah, thanks very much, Declan, for the introduction. And it's great to be on a, a panel of such, such great people and really excited to hear all the work that um, uh, Amelia and Alan were doing um, and, uh, and something else there. So hopefully some of the stuff that I will be talking about will resonate with that, because I think that there's an awful lot of really interesting things that have been brought up that are relevant to some of the research work that we're doing in ADAPT, especially around the kind of this kind of context sensitivity, um, this idea that, well, especially in terms of the user needs, user requirements needing to be understood and really well um, developed before we identify. So especially in terms of cases with children where we need to understand what the motivations are for interaction and how to plan those and get really engaging interactions. And I think there's some really interesting um, points to come through from that. So a bit about me, I suppose. So, you know, Declan's introduced me um, um, really well already, but um, I'm uh, um, Associate Professor at uh, University College Dublin. Um, and I have, for my sense, I have an obsession with speech and dialogue. Um, so, um, so for me, the interaction of speech interfaces and um, speech agents is one that's fascinating, but not necessarily from a technological point of view, but from a psychological dialogue based point of view. Uh, and this is where the human computer interaction element comes from this. And so we've been leading the way in a number of initiatives to try and understand dialogue between systems, but also to give tools to industry as well as to, to academia on how to design these appropriately. So we have a number of uh, design heuristics that we've developed and de design evaluation heuristics that can be used for speech-based tools and speech-based interfaces. But, um, but today what I'm going to talk about is a bit more about some of the cutting edge work we're looking at in terms of the future of speech systems or the future of speech agents and where they might be going. And I think it really resonates with some of the, some of the points that have been made already. Um, and uh, so, you know, it, it's kind of relatively glib to say that that speech interfaces and speech agents have kind of generally taken over as a major modality uh, for interaction, um, uh, kind of echoing what Amelia was saying in terms of, you know, people being not only digital, digitally native, but now kind of speech based native in terms of um, in terms of the interfaces they use, we see a number of users that we interview and that we interact with that use speech on a regular basis to interact with their devices. And that's because of the benefits that it brings, right? So it has, you know, you have, uh, it helps you enhance busy eyes, busy situations. And there's a lot of those that happen in life. So, um, so speech is a fantastic tool when it comes to these types of things. Um, 
But one of the interesting things that we're finding in our research is, you know, whenever there was a kind of initial piece of research that you'd see around these areas, it would be very focused on an individual level of using speech systems. The context where people are using these are very different now. So, um, you know, people may use this as part of a um, uh, part of the home in terms of kind of family interaction with a device. There's some really great work in 2018, 2019, looking at how families use these devices. Uh, so it makes a... Um, it makes uh, the interaction not necessarily a one-to-one -one interaction, but a one-to-many inter uh, interaction. So we call these kind of multi-party dialogues um, within, within the research space. And that was highlighted very well, actually, in, in, in Alan's video, that idea where you have three users of the, um, of the system um, that, would be, uh, that may be interacting within that. You may also have, you know, kind of kids with their, um, uh, with their friends around interacting with the voice system and voice interface uh, to conduct some collaborative activities. And so um, there's some things to think about here, whereas, you know, not only with the facts of different people interacting with different um, things, people may think that the system can do different things as well um, in that interaction, but also how we design for these types of these types of interactions in particular. So where we, um, you know, who's taking the lead in the interaction, who is, who isn't. Uh, and also, you know, this is a kind of social space where the information is being portrayed and being um, passed on through. So there's a number of pieces of research that we've been looking at in terms of that kind of dynamics, the multi-party dynamics that we see in this type of dialogue. But these are still generally very static devices in these environments. So what we tend to see is, uh, and what everybody who's, 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 who's on the call who's familiar with speech tends to see is it's very user-led and user-oriented. So even in the videos that we've seen today, there's a sense of it being the user trying to engage with the system and then the user will respond. Now, in dialogue, that's not necessarily always the case. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a unified activity. It's a joint activity that we conduct and that we do. So this brings me to the idea of what the future might actually hold when it comes to the kind of, um, you know, we maybe see in sort of 10, 15 years time around these areas of speech agents and speech interactions. And actually some, to some extent, these are actually being worked at, worked on as well in research laboratories across the world, but also in terms of industry-based research laboratories, looking at um, looking at these types of interactions. And that's the move from intelligent assistance, so someone who will be used, who will be um, uh, so to, for an agent that will be used at a particular moment in, in time by the user and started by the user, to an intelligent collaborator. So someone who is, or a system that is there to help you, yes, when required, when the user requests so, but also might be able to try and preempt some elements of being able to try and help you in particular situations, sorting out problems you maybe think you didn't have, but you, but you, but you do, or things that come down the line. The example, for instance, that Alan came up with about the idea of, you know, if someone has some expletive rant towards a system, it might mean that the system can then engage with the user rather than waiting for the system, for the user to ask the system for help. So, this is the kind of thing that we're envisaging um, within ADAPT uh, through some of the interaction, uh, interaction research strands that we see. Um, and this is kind of the, the idea of, um, you know, taking these voice, the voice agents and voice assistants to be collaborators in particular situations. So you might see in, you know, in the slide here, you might see that, you know, Alexa or Amazon Echo or whatever voice device you're using um, could be in a, in a collaborative kind of meeting environment, giving people statistics about that they may require for, for the particular meeting. Um, giving contextual information or giving information that might help with some decision making or some summary of the particular meeting as we go. So they become a, like a kind of a social actor within the, or, or a member of the team within that space. Now, this is an incredibly hard challenge to, to meet. And it's not only because of the facts that, that um, technologically difficult, but from a human computer interaction point of view, this is incredibly tough to get right. So there's a lot of um, work, for instance, uh, it's been done in Microsoft Research um, over in Seattle that looks at the idea of AI being proactive um, around this and how we get mixed initiative artificial intelligence systems. And the answer is, it's just, it's really difficult. But one of the, um, some of the things to consider here are, 
that as we've seen actually from all the presentations here today, I think that context sensitive design is key. So there's a sense of trying to understand the context that you're interacting in. And if you have an agent that's going to be proactive, that's going to be trying to help you and support you in a proactive way, giving you information or giving you support in that way, it needs to be sensitive to what you're doing. It needs to be sensitive to the task you're conducting, but also the environment you're in. So if you're in a social environment, it may not be great to blurt out particular um, things by voice, you might be able to deliver it by text or deliver it by um, through a screen based device that someone has. If, they're with, if they have headphones on, that might be fine. But we need to be kind of um, sensitive to those elements of context and we need to be designing towards those things. One of the things as well to consider here is that if you have a proactive agent that we've been kind of uh, looking at within the adapt space, there's a sense of, the, um, of knowing when to initiate. So what we don't want is a kind of a is a is a speech agent version of Clippy, um, which might end up uh, you know uh, annoying the users more than more than anything. But part of that to achieving that that vision is to know when in a person's task it is it's appropriate to interrupt them or it's appropriate to engage with them whenever conducting a particular task. So we're conducting a number a lot of work with some cognitive scientists um, at Utrecht who are experts in what's called task interleaving. So when people are doing a number of tasks at the same time, um, as well as trying to identify whenever someone's conducting a task, when is the best time for, um, when is the best time for uh, any technology to interrupt? Um, so speech is, is kind of, um, is one of those technologies that we're looking at at the moment to try and see when's the right moment in a task to, 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 to jump in uh, with, those situ with those situations. You also then need to figure out how to initiate. So we're doing some work on what, what the wording should be like of those initiations. So do you want your agent to be direct and blunt or do you want it to be polite um, uh, in those types of situations? And this might depend again on the context and the task at hand that you're trying to help them with. So imagine if you're in a, um, in a car situation uh, and a, an agent in your car is, is, is trying to give you information about dangers ahead, if you're in an automated vehicle, for instance, um, and you need to take over at the wheel uh, or something like that, you may not necessarily want the agent to be hesitant, polite, and unclear. You might expect the agent to be interrupting you straight away with the specific form of information with, um, with particular speech signals that would highlight how urgent the request is. So we need, um, uh, so we need to think about that design space, that area of how to initiate and and uh, and um, and how the design of that should be done. Also, like you know, why we should be initiating in the first place. It may be that particular tasks that people are doing, they might they might want initiate um, you know kind of urgent notifications or urgent um, uh, kind of collaboration to occur only in specific situations. So um, so we need to find out when those situations might be. And in terms of the kind of the context that this might be appropriate in, we've been kind of talking about this in, in, in our lab at present, is this idea of, especially in the car, it's one of the areas where we're, we're, um, we're looking at at the moment. A lot of the research in terms of proactive speech agents seems to be placing them in the element of automated driving or the element of, of, um, of, uh, of, of driving. Um, uh, and uh, so this is one of the contexts where we feel it's quite appropriate to have these kind of proactive agents in these situations um, and to, to, to have a kind of research set, um, sets there as well. But there's also a number of different other contexts here highlighted. So things like the, you know, having needs in the home to giving you customer tech support, um, uh, as well as having, potentially having kind of proactive agents as, um, you know, kind of child-based agents that you, that you interact with. I just want to leave you on the idea that basically one of the things that we, we're trying to do with the HCI set of things here is, again, as I said, not to leave us with a clippy that just pops up with no for no reason at all, uh, but something that is useful and is engaging and is appropriate uh, and helps users with the tasks that they want to conduct and the tasks they have at hand. So without, uh, without further ado, I will pass you back over to Declan. I think I did use those two, minute, two minutes, Alan, so thank you very much <laughs> for that. Well used. Um, but, but I'll, I'll pass them over, pass you over to Dex on there. Cool. Well, thank you, um, Ben, and thanks everybody for uh, those really engaging and interesting uh, talks. Um, we, we've got uh, officially five minutes, but I'm sure we could stretch it to ten. And um, there's a number of questions in the chat stream there. Um, maybe just to kick off, we heard from Ben there about you know proactive agency and 
um, the, the theme actually that Alan had mentioned around this sort of preemption and anticipatory uh, interaction. So is, 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 that a, is that a key sort of development that we're going to see that we might expect as consumers in the technology that we interact with, this sort of sense of anticipation? And that's it generally to whoever wants to take that. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, the, um, I see, like, along with, um, along with the sort of platforms that we're building, where we're building platforms that are working predominantly based on interaction, and interactions are initiated either proactively or reactively to the customer having a need. But there are also um, a plethora of systems that are working in the background to, to uh, tune uh, what our Wi-Fi networks or tune things that are happening in the home and to, uh, cybersecurity, for example, is another example where um, tests are constantly being uh, done, uh, threats are being thwarted. Um, so I think a, an awful lot of things are happening in the background. Now, it, it brings up the question about um, the, the, the organizations who are paying for those proactive or for those kind of proactive or preemptive platforms what's the appropriate amount of communication to the customer to know a that i've handed value but not communicate in a way that becomes alarmist for example cybersecurity wrestles with you know telling you that there's been a threat thwarted would be fine for me it would be earth shattering for my mother uh, to be, and I would probably get a phone call quite rapidly after that to say that something had been thwarted. Um, but yeah, so there's a there is an increasing investment in 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 that sort of elegant simplicity of stuff happening in the background. But there's also a balance between how do you what's the pace and cadence of communication to the customers to let them know what's happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so it kind of it kind of gets into maybe privacy and ethics there as well. So I mean, there are clearly ethical dimensions to, as you mm -hmm. kind of design out these platforms and solutions. Would anybody like to comment on that? Well, uh, privacy is a huge thing in um, my field. Um, just with children's speech data, that's a pretty obvious one, and it, it's. Um, easy to understand, but I think the more data that we generate, the more data that we use to build things, um, like we're going into the Wild West here, Some like there are no standards, there are, well, I mean, there are, but they're, we're scrabbling to get them together uh, as more things, um, more data points get generated. Um, I was talking to somebody recently about, um, you know, different strands of data. So, um, if you have one database with certain information and that's all private and another database with different information, but the two of them together can actually reveal things about particular users. These are all things that um, are very difficult to preempt. And I think it's really, really important going forward that any company dealing with private data or about to, or generating data that could then turn out to um, reveal things about their customers. We need to be absolutely transparent about what we're doing. We need to be completely ethical about what we're doing and we need to meet regularly to discuss these unknown things that arise and how to actually deal with them. One of the things in my company is that we, you know, we take data privacy very seriously and we follow all the protocols and all the rules that are available. But there are still situations that like, for example, what if a child uh, says their parents' names and uh, reveals their credit card numbers in an audio file and our client sends that? You know, we've had, that, that could happen. I've never heard it happen, but before, but we do have protocol in place within our company that everybody in the company is aware of about what to do if you encounter potentially sensitive information. And it basically involves just deleting it and being very transparent about it. And I think as long as everybody's heart is in the right place and um, we're being intelligent about this, that we can really we can use data for good instead of having it this murky area that everybody uh, mistrusts. So um, I, I really think that um, companies should band together to, to champion this kind of approach. I think, yeah, I just wanted to come in there as well, but I, I, I think there's, um, especially when you think about kind of multi, multi user contexts, mm -hmm. the, the, there's a sense of, you know, who's the, who's the initial, who's the user and who are the people who could be potential users in the future? Like if you're sitting there with four people who are gonna be using a, a smart speaker, there are, you know, and, and so, you know, how, what about the people who are not necessarily in the room, 
sorry, who are in the room but are not necessarily interacting with the smart speaker, they might their data might be being collected by that smart speaker at the same time. So there's a number of huge challenges when it comes to this idea that that these are these are you know multi-user um, home devices, and also then when it comes down to kind of proactive elements like you know how you're going to be interpreting that data and then you know sort of maybe even engaging someone that isn't really you know that isn't directly engaging with the system um in that kind of collaborative uh, environment these are all really big challenges and they and they they the ones that kind of i think some of the some of the major players need to kind of step up and really engage with here because there's there's no real known solutions to this yet i don't, I, I don't get the sense that that's the case mm -hmm. um but i i but i i i i, I love the fact that that you know there are there are there are aspects in place for instance in soapbox labs where there are you know there, there's some real sensitivity to that because as researchers we're very sensitive to that when they're doing evaluations like there's about there's ethical standards for data gathering and evaluation, data gathering in terms of what you do with human participants. And that, that I think needs to be boiled into some of the aspects that we do with not only evaluations of tech when we're doing them in industry-based standards, but also um, how tech, how, how data is being used for tech development. And so, actually um, speech technology can really help with this because, you know, when you think about yeah. building an evaluation set based on some kind of multi-user interaction, what if um, some of those users were, um, younger than 12 years old and some weren't um, it's very time consuming to sit down and have somebody try to judge that and to transcribe everything um, ironically the use of speech technology built on these voices can give you a tool provide you a tool to say right well these two voices are underage and therefore we follow these privacy protocols these ones aren't so therefore we follow different ones so I, I think uh, we should be building tools like this all the time yeah the, the other challenge is that increasingly um we're dealing with um ecosystems in in the home or in the environments that are owned by multiple providers so we have mm. like you've got games that will play on game servers that will be on distribution gaming platforms that will sit on television sets that will sit on a wan that will sit on a lan and all of those the the relationship the commercial relationship are all separate typically and yes. the only unifying factor is the consumer but nobody has a a commercial imperative to act across all platforms for the consumer's good they all act within the boundaries of their own provision of their own service so these are other challenges that these are kind of informal technical technical technological standard based ecosystems but don't have any commercial interaction mm. yeah it's a really interesting point you know and you'd wonder well who steps in there is it is it a regulator is it a you know kind of various different communities or ecosystems or you know credit you know, if someone needs to compel each organization to follow standards that are that are consistent with everybody else's standards but that yeah. doesn't that level of sophistication that governance doesn't exist and i wouldn't be holding my breath either yeah yeah okay very good um I, i'm conscious of time here and we have um i think this question is probably our comment alan directed uh, towards you it's from juliet mccann and she she says that um does this not represent amazing possibilities for smart working where companies and organizations can support their staff wherever they are? Now, I know your key customers are telcos, but um, are you seeing any kind of interest in using your kind of technology for orchestrating interactions specifically to support home workers? Well, ma massively so, because if you consider, if you just consider the investment that organizations make in securing their own networks and their own systems, and they did so always on the premise that the predominant amount of interaction would take place in an office so that most of the investment goes into the technologies that are on a kind of you know on a specific hardened LAN. Now increasingly it's all done over VPN, it's all distributed, but all of the investment you had that would that presumed a single or a or, or a or, or a, a small number of locales is now massively distributed. So technologies like so what's happening now is operators and communication providers are 
are trying to jump into that opportunity and say, look, we should have a suite of offerings and services that replicate the investments that organizations have made in, on the presumption of, a, of an office. Um, and we now need to do that on our network to give the same um, performance criteria, the same service levels, uh, interventions, um, application optimizations, et cetera, all done from the home. So yeah, it, like that, the world shifting out of offices and to a more distributed model definitely disrupts and is creatively disrupts um, how we work and, and that will provide opportunities for organizations to, um, to support employees better. Okay, great. Yeah, a lot of interest in that. Um, uh, Richard Green uh, kind of uh, gives you a thumbs up there on, on those points, Alan. I think specifically around the the uh, the you know the no consistent commercial model where you have kind of multiple providers delivering kind of um, the ecosystem in the home. Um, okay, so have you any kind of final comments that you want to make before we wrap it up? Um, we could probably go an extra hour, but we don't have the time uh, today. We will maybe schedule another webinar. We never even got into health or cars or lots of other areas where API is super interesting. Um, so do you any final remarks or comments that anybody wants to make before we wrap up? No? I mean, yeah. it, it, the, uh, the only thing I would say is like, it, I mean, um, human computer interaction as a field has never been more relevant based on the you know a growing awareness of just how difficult it is to build simplicity into our relationships with technology and it is like it's ripe with opportunity because the problems are enormous they're so nuanced and so difficult and so varied um that this will be with us for for, for decades to come to try to create um, seamless, uh, seamless and simple interfaces that just get the job done that the that the customer or interactor wants. Mm. So yeah, so it's a it's never been a more relevant time to be in this field. Cool. Right. The, uh, well, I was I was just going to echo that and basically say, I mean, from our from our our view from from an academic perspective as well, there's it's, it's really nice to see that sense of. Um, of engagement with speech-based technology from the human computer interaction um, field and that sense that the that the problems are are enormous because because as humans we're really complex. Um, and so there needs to be huge amounts more research work around this as well, as well as kind of investment um, from an industry industry perspective of taking a user-first perspective when it comes to designing and devising these types of tools, not especially in speech, because there's so many tools that are designed in speech that I don't know any user would actually want them. So, um, so there's a number of times where if we have a user first approach, we can get user centered speech, um, uh, you know, kind of interactions and ones that work for the people who want to use them. Cool, great. Well, look, should we leave it at that? Or did you have a final comment, Amelia? Um, just a uh, final comment would be that um, when it comes to personalization of human computer interaction, I think this can happen at the micro level when you're looking at individual users and their individual requirements, but also on a more macro level, like with speech recognition, um, nobody was looking at why children would need speech recognition. Nobody was modifying the outputs of it and the, the actions of it to actually suit children's environments and use cases. And we're doing that now and we're seeing huge interest and huge uptake in this area. And it just goes to show like the technology is there and by all means we need so much more research in it, but also how it's used, how we can personalize it to different user groups, different users themselves. Um, I read recently that, you know, even though the wheel was invented 5,000 years ago, it wasn't until the 1970s that somebody put it on a suitcase. I think we're experiencing the same thing with voice technologies. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. I have some great points there. I have to say, I really, really, really loved um, uh, the talks this morning. It's so engaging. You know, the, um, the, the, that this field, HCI field, has been never more relevant, taking a, a user-first approach, the... Um, the, the the you know and um, almost the the apparent conflict in 
the difficulty in building simplicity. I just love that idea and these fun, frictionless interactions and experiences. There's so many um, almost Instagrammable quotes uh, out of this morning sessions. I really appreciate your uh, ideas and inspiration and input there. So without further ado, thank you very much. I know that when this ends, it'll be an abrupt ending. So I won't have a chance to sort of thank you offline, but I'll, I'll ring you guys later. Thanks a million for it. And thanks to uh, our audience as well, who joined in this morning and for the great questions. And uh, shortly, this will be available as a catch up video on our website. So um, you can always share it with your friends then. So thank you very much, everyone.